Okay, let me say good evening to everyone again and welcome to our study session. I hope you had a very relaxing holiday and I really appreciate the opportunity I have to share with you again as we study the word. And as you join us tonight, we are going to be in for, I believe, a very exciting study. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24. And we hope to examine this in pretty great detail and great depth. And I'm going to try to meticulously go through it with you so you have a clear understanding of what this particular chapter is saying, because there are a lot of views and a lot of interpretations associated with Matthew chapter 24. And there are many Bible interpreters that see a, a whole number of different perspectives and from Matthew chapter 24, people have concluded that there is going to be a secret rapture, uh, which we will examine in our last session. There are people who conclude that from Matthew chapter 24, there's going to be a great tribulation. They see the Antichrist in Matthew chapter 24. And many theologians see what is indicated there in, in that chapter as signs as of, in relation to the end of time. So people interpret Revelation, um, Matthew chapter 24, in, in ways that support, by and large, the premillennial view. And why it is important for us to get a closer examination of this text is because we need to understand clearly what Jesus is trying to impart to us from this passage of scripture. So it means that we have to go through it very carefully. And this is why perhaps it may take us two sessions rather than one. I don't think we can go through it in the detail that, that is necessary tonight because there is so much depth that we have to gather. We, we are going to try to employ as much as possible some of the principles which were identified in our first session because that is very, very essential. So we have to look at the context in which this, this chapter is seen. We have to look at the intent of the person giving the information in, in this chapter, which is Jesus. What message was he hoping to convey? What did he want his listeners to understand about what he's saying? That is very, very important. We also have to get a historical background to give us a, a better understanding of what Jesus was dealing with. So we're going to be looking at some extra biblical sources. Remember, I indicated that one of the principles that we must employ when we're trying to interpret the word is look for extra biblical information because all the details connected to a particular passage will not be identified in the passage that we have before us. But there's additional information which gives some insight into what Jesus was prophesying. And so we can look at the history which has been indicated to us by one of the very prominent, well-known Jewish historians. This is Josephus, because he would have written a 200-page account giving great detail as to what happened during the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's important to know that he was a witness to what transpired because he was a contemporary of, of the day. As a matter of fact, Joseph has indicated that he himself was, was, was caught in the whole Holocaust and he had to hide himself between some of the dead bodies to avoid being killed. So he, he's given a perspective as an eyewitness. So it is very important that we pay some attention to the details that, that he has given. Because those details will help us understand that Jesus is making a specific prophecy to a specific, specific people at a particular time. And so we need that, we need to take that into, into consideration because we, we have to dispel the, the particular interpretation that Matthew chapter 24 is relating to our times and in time events that we will see in our generation. We have to make that very clear. So that we need to understand 
um, that there is a historical account which shows the accuracy of Jesus' prediction. And we have to bear in mind that if, if Jesus is making a prophetic um, revelation, that we have to consider what he says is accurate and it's the truth. And so if he is making a prediction that has application to the people living at that time, he's making a prediction to a specific group of people in a specific locality, which means that there, there is some lo, lo, locality to what he is, is trying to project and not perhaps a universal application that some people interpret. And that's why there are some theologians that would indicate that what Jesus is saying is relevant to our particular time. If that is the case, it means that Jesus' prediction then will not have been accurate because he was prophesying that for a particular time, which is not the time that we indicate it would be our own um, understanding and in our own 21st century experience. So we need to, to bear that in mind. I have prepared some notes for you because I think it's important to give you some little indicators of some things that are, are significant that we have to come to understand and, and come to grips with. So as we go through the session, you will see little clips that will bring up some rich references or some important notes which I want you to have. I promise you too that in some of the previous sections that we have already gone through, that we will give some notes for those people who will want you know, some references to be able to check that one and some information which you know you might perhaps have forgotten because a lot of details involved in this study. And I would want you to be able to recall as much information as possible. So what I promise is that what will happen is that the sessions that have gone before, I will try to give you some notes that you can have that you can be able to observe. So what we're going to be doing tonight is to just get an overview of, of the chapter, identify some, some key verses, which I think are very, very significant in us understanding what this particular chapter is, is trying to teach us. I think that sometimes the misunderstanding comes because of a misinterpretation of passages in, in Luke chapter 24, which bear reference to things that have been highlighted in the Old Testament. Because we have to bear in mind that Matthew 24 involves prophetic literature, because Jesus is making a prophecy about events that are to take place. He has a specific time period in mind, and he is speak, speaking to a specific group of people. So it means that those details are very much connected to the group of persons that he's speaking to, and the information that he is identifying bears particular relevance to those people. And so they have to understand it in relation to their time. So when we are inclined to look at some of these passages, because honestly speaking, when you when you look at some of the references that we are going to be highlighting in, in this chapter, they, they really would give the impression that they're referring to, to times that are to take place in the future or events that are to take place in the future. I myself previously would quote some, some passages from this particular chapter in relation to intent events because I was sort of caught in, in the whole interpretation of the, the pre-millennialists who view Matthew chapter 24 as pointing very much the events that will take place in our time before the return of Christ. So people will be inclined then to look at world events, look at things that are happening and make predictions based on what we see happening current because we are interpreting Matthew chapter 24 to be specifically related to our times. And so I would have found myself doing that until I got to do an in-depth study and analysis and, and check then references that have been used in the Old Testament 
which compare very much with what Jesus is trying to show us in this particular passage. So because he's using prophetic literature, we didn't have to understand the language that he's using. Because this is also, as I indicated, very important in, in, in the principles that we have to apply in interpreting a particular passage. And this one needs, to a large extent, us making reference to the testament passage that Jesus are, is quoting, and he is bringing into play to help us to understand what he's trying to say. Because if we, if we miss that particular context, then it is easy for us to misinterpret um, the intention of, of Jesus and the message which he's trying to, to give to us because we have misunderstood some of those references. And very often when prophetic language is, is being used, the, the, the language is very often symbolic. We see that quite applicable to the Old Testament, and we see many of the New Testament writers also drawing references to some of those Old Testament prophecies to help interpret New Testament experiences. So we're going to realize, maybe, maybe make the comparison, that Jesus is quoting from Joel, he is quoting from Daniel, he is quoting, he's quoting from Zechariah, he is quoting from Ezekiel. He's quoting from Isaiah. And when he say quoting, he's drawing references, but bear in mind that, that many of the prophecies which were given to these Old Testament prophets would have come uh, as revelation. So if, the, if it is coming as revelation, we have to bear in mind the source of that revelation will be Jesus himself. And therefore, it is not a matter just of Jesus quoting, but he he is drawing references from information that he was already, visions or prophecy that he was already given. And he is drawing the analogy so we will understand the connection and the relevance to what he would have already given or inspired with those Old Testament um, prophets. And when you really begin to look at it closely, it, it gives you a better understanding and a, and a different perspective of how we view Matthew chapter 24. So we refer to Matthew chapter 24, as I indicated previously, as the Olivet Discourse, because this was a sermon that Jesus was issuing to his disciples and the multitude that was gathered. But it is inclusive of chapter 23, and it is extended to chapter 25. As Jesus would have been in the temple, and he would have been dialoguing with those people in the temple, and then he would have moved from the temple onto the Mount of Olives, but some of the information that he was giving in chapter 23 is very much connected to the, the Olivet Discourse, what he is saying in chapter 24. We will look back at some of the, the, the information that he was given in Matthew 23 to connect with what he is saying in Matthew chapter 24, so that it was also help to give us a clear understanding of the context in, in which this discourse is taking place. So we will go through the chapter verse by verse so we get a, a general understanding of, of, of what it is saying. And I will explain as we go through verse by verse what is the, the context and precisely what Jesus is saying. In, in our notes tonight, you will get some reference to the specific um, prophecy details that Jesus gave as sign course events that were to follow. And we're going to train very much to see how they will be connected to the experience of the people in Jerusalem at the time. Because if the prophecy is related to them, we have to look for the fulfillment in their time. And this is where we're going to draw reference from some of the historical information we have to show how these prophecies were actually fulfilled in the time period that Jesus was actually given the prophecy in connection to. So it will clear the misunderstanding that the, the, the chapter is only connected to events that are going to be happening in the future that we are to be looking for. Now, there are some people who have been convinced that Matthew chapter 24 is really dealing with the destruction of the Jewish temple and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But they apply the whole concept of, of, of dual prophecy 
or what they call primary and secondary prophecy. So they say, yes, we can see where the application comes in relation to the destruction of the Jewish temple. The, the, the information shows distinctly that Jesus could have been speaking directly to those people and he was making a prophecy that would take place in that particular generation. But, but then they say that but there could be a secondary application, which could be then signs that we could also see coming in our future experience. But the reality of that is you will have to wait for those signs to be unfold before you can actually be able to say, yes, that is the fulfillment of the prophecy. But the reality is we can check the historical account, and we can see that the specific references that Jesus made to the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70 were actually fulfilled. There are Jewish historians that give information that can be verified. And it shows then the reliability of the Bible and the accuracy of prophecy. And it shows then the, the truth of what Jesus was trying to get us to understand in relation to prophecy and the fulfillment of it and how accurate prophecy can be because indeed it is coming from the one who is the chief among all prophets. So we're going to look at some scripture references which I think are very, very important that we understand and these are what we would consider as key verses. And, and these key verses, I will just give a, a little background on them but we will get more detail on them as we go into the study. So the first of these key verses is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And the reason why I call these key verses is because these are verses that sometimes draw people away from looking at the prophecy as directly connected to the, the people of that generation that Jesus was speaking to. And, and then they misinterpret and apply that particular prophecy so something in the future. So Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then shall the end come. I'll read that again. And you should see it come up on the on screen. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then shall the end come. So people are inclined to think that one of the signs of the end of the world, because that's how they interpret the end coming, they, they think that the end there means the end of the world. I used to think that way too. I used to say that before the end comes, the gospel must reach all parts of the world as a witness. So until that happens, then we can't expect the end. Which means then that people are following as to where the gospel has reached and where it has not reached because they are looking at that as a sign post or a sign mark for the return of Christ. And so we need to pay a careful attention to the fact that Jesus in the, in the second part of, of this chapter is indicating that there are no specific signs connected to his return. And we, we're going to examine that carefully and, and, and get an understanding that we are not to be looking for specific signs and gauging the time of his return because it was made clear that, that nobody knows the time of his return. So the end there is often interpreted to mean the end of the world. But when Jesus is talking about the end coming, is meaning the end of Jerusalem and the end of the temple as existing. It's the end of, of a particular experience. It's the end of Jerusalem being the capital of, of, of religious experience and proclamation. It's the end of, of the temple as being the place where people saw God dwelt, and that it was the, the place where the nations would be gathered to, to, to God and to worship. 
that's how it was viewed in that time. And so when Jesus is speaking of the end, he is indicating to them that it is going to come to the end of, of that Old Testament experience because it's the beginning of a new experience. So there are some theologians that will say that Matthew 24, when I'm pointing to the end of the world and uh, us looking for end time events, it's really pointing to a new beginning, a new experience, a new covenant, and a, and a new relationship between God and the Jews because he's ushering now the establishment of, of his kingdom and coming in its glory and its power. So it's the end of an era, the end of a dispensation, the end of an age, the end of a Jewish experience, the end of the Old Testament experience, where Judaism was the main way of, of connecting to God. So that's how the end can be viewed. We look at that in more detail when we are actually going through the passage. Then there is Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Hear the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel is inferred by some theologians to be referring to the Antichrist. When the Antichrist is going to come in, when the Jews are reigning with Christ in the thousand year period in the millennium, and that he is going to sign an agreement with the Jews, and he's going to break that covenant, and then he's going to come in and desolate the temple. And he's going to bring destruction to the sacrifices and the Jewish experiences as we know. So that's how they see that verse. So again, they are connecting it to a future experience because they are seeing that this particular reference is, is referring to the coming of the Christ. Now notice Jesus is drawing a connection between what Daniel spoke. And he's making a connection between what he's prophesying and what Daniel spoke to. If he's prophesying or something that is going to happen in, in the generation that is going to be present at that time, then it is obvious that he could not have been referring to the Antichrist in the way we see the Antichrist. Because for us, Antichrist will still be a person to come in the future. So then that, that would mean that Jesus' prediction and his prophecy, which would be relevant to, to, to those people at that time, then would not be relevant because it would mean that that has not been fulfilled as yet if you're looking for the price come. So could there be another connection? Now when Daniel made that prophecy, obviously he was, he was pointing to the, the same experience that Jesus is going to be speaking about where the Roman army is coming and a Roman general is going to bring desolation in the temple. Now it is true that the temple was basically desolated on a number of occasions. We had the desolation of the temple by the Assyrians. We had the desolation of the temple by the Babylonians who overthrew Jerusalem. And this was a prophecy which came from Jeremiah. And they brought desolation to the temple. And then there was also a, another ruler by the name of Antiochus IV who brought desolation to the temple. And this was, I think, in about 167 BC, where he actually sacrificed pigs on the altar as an insult to the Jews because he, he knew what, what, the, what pigs represented in their custom. And he sacrificed pigs on the altar. So he brought desolation. So some people indicate that there could be a dual application to that. And Daniel would have been drawn reference to what Antiochus did. But Jesus was making the quotation to indicate that when they see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, which means then that the people living at that time would be seeing a form of desolation. It could not be the future Antichrist. Could not be Antiochus because he had he had um, caused that desolation before. It could not have been the Duke Nazar because he had caused that desolation in 586 BC. So then that prophecy will have to be connected to something that those people will see. 
Because Jesus is saying, when you therefore shall see, when you, he's speaking specifically to the people that are before him. And he's saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, he is actually implying that what Daniel said in relation to the abomination is bearing specific reference to something that they will see. And it actually happened in history. And so we can see directly then when we look at the historical record that Jesus was speaking to the people at that time. And that is another prophecy that while we want to project it for the future in relation to the Antichrist coming and bringing desolation in the temple, that Jesus was telling the people living then that you will see. When you see that happening, remember what Daniel spoke of in terms of the abomination of desolation. We'll get a little more detail about that when we go into in specific um, exposition of it, and then we make comparison to the reference that was quoted from in Daniel chapter 9. Now, another key verse is Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, watch that phrase carefully, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Remember, I said to you that the premillennial theologians use this passage to refer very much to a tribulation that is to come, which they refer to as the great tribulation. And, and, and that tribulation must take place before the rapture. Um, sorry, that tribulation will take place after the, the rapture has happened because they are, they are arguing that Christians are not to go through the tribulation. So in this quotation here, and it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then it goes on to mention about the sign of man coming on the clouds and sending his angels to, to gather the elect. It is easy to think that that particular reference, again, is, is, is indicating a fulfillment in the future. And, and that is an application that is often, very often made. But look at it carefully. And you ask yourself if you are expecting the statement here made by Jesus to be actually fulfilled literally. The sun darkened, the moon not given light, like the stars falling from heaven and the powers of heaven shaken. So if you're predicting that this is something that's happening in the future after the great tribulation, and we're looking for this to literally happen, it means that we're going to be expecting then that the sun is going to be darkened, the moon goes into darkness as well, stars fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shaken, if you interpret that literally. What we're going to realize, and there are a number of Bible references which I will draw on as indicated before. Jesus had drawn references from a number of the Old Testament prophets. And what I will do, maybe when we get into a, a meticulous study of the references in relation to this particular uh, passage here, you will see that some of the same language is used in Joel, in Zechariah, in Isaiah. Some of that language is relating to specific things that happen at specific times are relating to a specific people. And if we do not use then the same reference to relate to our future, then we are going to have to question why we would want to use a similar quotation, a similar um, literary style used here by Jesus to be referring to something that is to happen in the future. So and we, we get back this particular reference as we go through the chapter. I will draw these references to you, and you will see for yourself how they compare remarkably with what Jesus is saying to us here in this particular reference in Matthew. And you can see the analogy that they made, and you can see the reference that is being made, and then you can get to understand in literary style, because very often prophets use what we call hyperbole. They use exaggeration 
intended exaggeration to, to make a specific point that is, is very significant that they want to emphasize. And we often use hyperbole in our, in our language. Sometimes we use it without even realizing it. But we will say, for example, I feel so hungry that I would eat a meal. Well, you really don't mean that literally. So that's an exaggeration. That's a form of hyperbole. You, you are, are deliberately exaggerating to make a point that you are really hungry. That you feel so hungry that you eat a meal. Jesus used hyperbole in another way. And he says, if your body causes you to stumble, plug it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. We really think that Jesus is saying to mutilate your body, pull your eye, cut off your hand. If they cause you to stumble, no, it's an exaggeration. That's another form of hyperbole. Jesus is emphasizing a particular point. I want us to see the significance of how we should respond to sin. We should let nothing get in the way of causing us to stumble. We should be willing to eliminate things that cause us to stumble. He's not literally telling us to pluck our eye off or to cut our hands off. So this is an exaggeration. And we see that often used by the prophets. So to make a significant point and to really emphasize it. Sometimes language like this draws references from the celestial bodies. To emphasize a judgment and how distressful that judgment is going to be. And they are trying to, to emphasize the point that is being made by drawing references to um, symbolic language in, in that literary form as an exaggeration. It's like the sun being darker and the moon going out and the stars falling from heaven. Not literally stars falling from heaven because if the, if the stars fall from heaven, that would be cutting, um, cataclysmic. And, and this same sort of literary expression is used other parts of the Bible referring to judgment that God will bring on specific nations at a specific time. And no stars fell from heaven. The moon was not blotted out, and the sun did not cease to shine. So you can understand then clearly that he was trying to emphasize a particular point and show something in a very significant way. So, as I indicated, we are going to draw on some of these references. I'm going to show you some of these passages when we get there. Right then, the next one is Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. And this is a this is a very significant one. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. This generation, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, the theologians who project a futuristic interpretation are saying that these things are to be fulfilled in the future and that they have not happened as yet indicate that this phrase here is making reference to the generation that will be living at the time. Now, Jesus made reference in a, in a parable, he drew reference in this same. Um, context here in Matthew chapter 24 of the fig tree. Remember Jesus passed by the fig tree, drained it up, and people say symbolically that is Jesus indicating that he's bringing an end to the Jewish dispensation, but in the future he's going to restore the Jews. So the fig tree that was drained up is going to blossom again. What they are predicting from their uh, interpretation is that the, the Jews will again blossom in the future. That they will be restored to their former glory by Christ. And when we see the Jews returning to their former glory, that, that is an indication that we are coming close to the end. And they use that as an indication that when we see the Jews prospering, when we see the Jews return um, to, their, to their state, when we see Jerusalem being established, 
even when they see the temple being rebuilt, because they believe that the temple will be rebuilt again in Jerusalem. So all of these are signposts that, that that interpretation, that particular interpretation is looking for, and they believe that this generation is referring to a generation of the future. But remember, I made reference to Matthew chapter 23, and, and, and Jesus made reference to the generation at that time in Matthew chapter 23. And when he was speaking of that generation, he obviously would, be, would have been speaking to the, the Jews at that particular time. I'm going to draw reference to that. I don't have it in, in, in your slide. But I'm going to draw reference to it so you understand that when we look at the term this generation, Jesus is speaking to the generation of people living at the time when they will see the destruction of Jerusalem. And as a matter of fact, historically, all of what Jesus pre pre predicted happened within a generation. In other words, within a 40 year span, as a matter of fact, it was about between 37 and 38 years after we just made the prophecy that they began to see all the things being fulfilled that Jesus had indicated in his prophetic discourse would happen. So it's obvious then that he was speaking to that generation. And he's, he's telling them that that generation will be present when all the things that he's going to say to them unfold right before their very eyes. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33 to 36, remember this is part of the discourse. He said, ye serpent, ye generation of vipers, how shall he escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Watch the language carefully. Some of them, you scribes, you people, you, your generation, you are going to crucify. You are going to kill some of the persons I sent to you. Some of them you shall scourge in your synagogue. Me, you're, you're going to flog them. You're going to beat them. You see that happened to Peter and John. You see it happened to the Apostle Paul. They're going to persecute them from city to city. So who he was speaking to them, he said, you generation. He was speaking to people right in his presence. I remember Matthew chapter 23 is connected to the Olivet Discourse, which includes 23, 24, and 25. So why would we predict when he uses the term, this generation will see all these things being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 24, that he means a generation of the future, not a generation that will be present at the time when the temple was destroyed. He went on to say that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel unto Zechariah, the son of Arachiah, where he slew between the temple and the altar. Early I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. What Jesus is saying is that judgment is going to come on you because of what you have done to the prophets I sent to you what you have done even to the disciples that were in your midst, that you flowed, that you persecuted from city to city, and that you, you crucified, that you killed, that he was even making reference to himself because they were going to him. So it means, therefore, that that reference that Jesus was using, this generation is referring to the generation that will be alive at the time when the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple takes place. This happened historically in AD 17. So these are four passages that people very often use that tend to draw them to the interpretation that Jesus is prophesying of something further down in time. And I could also indicate here that the book of Revelation written by, by John Remember, I indicated you previously that John was going through tribulation at the time. He was banished on the Isle of Patmos during part of the tribulation that the Jews would have been experiencing. And in the very first chapter, John indicated 
And this is the revelation given to him by Jesus. So the same Jesus that gave the prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, is the same Jesus that is giving John the revelation. And he's indicating to John that some of the things that I am showing you about the distress that will take place, about the famine and the pestilence that will take place, of the, of the signs that you see unfold before you, these things are going to shortly come to pass. That's what John mentioned in the very first chapter, in the very, the very um, epilogue. He is indicating that what he is showing as the signs will shortly come to pass. And then he went on to mention that the time is near. So the people then who use Revelation to predict again a, a future tribulation and to predict a whole lot of things that will come in the future, they need to bear in mind that Jesus himself said in the Revelation of John that those things will shortly come to pass and that the time was at hand or the time was near. So if John then was writing about anywhere between 63 and 64 um, AD, he indeed will be writing about the things that were going to shortly come to pass and the time was near because then all the things that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 would have come to pass in AD 70, which would harmonize with what John was being shown in the book of Revelation. And so you have to apply a large part of what John is seeing in symbolic form as connected to what Jesus was predicting would happen in the text that we are, are going to examine before us in Matthew chapter 24. So, so I want you to, to, to bear those things in mind because they are significant in us getting the correct understanding and interpretation of the text. But indicated before that if, if you quote a text with a presupposition, in other words, a position that you're trying to defend, then you're going to read that text in the light of that presupposition. So many of the premillennial theologians who go to Matthew chapter 24 with a, a preconceived idea that, that it is referring to the end time because that's how they view um, the, the prophecy. Then they're, they're going to interpret all the references in the through that lens. And then significant things that they should pay attention to, they might overlook. Now, and I'm, I'm not saying that they're malicious and that is a deliberate attempt to deceive people. What I'm saying is that if you are going to study the scripture from a position of trying to defend um, a, a review or a perspective that you have, you could easily mislook, mis, um, represent or overlook important details that could clarify some of the issues and that could give you a different interpretation. It is just like some of the, the scientists who, who support um, the Darwinistic position of evolution. They look at evidence in the light of their worldview that Darwinism is right, that evolution is scientific, and that the world formed itself through a natural, biological, of, of, you know, a natural process, and that it did not need any God or any deity or any intelligent being to have created it. So even when evidence come to the fore that indicate intelligent design, even when there's evidence that, that refutes what Darwin says, even when there's evidence that contradict previous scientific position that they have, they are so adamant about defending that position that they bypass the evidence that is, is given to them. And they still hold on to their particular perspective. And so sometimes what um, theologians can do in, in terms of defending a particular position, they could bypass critical information or evidence which could give a different view on the one that they have previously held. But you see, you must be willing to be able now, if you see that coming away from it, they indicated to you in our first session, uh, there are a number of, of very good scholarly um, theologians who were formerly premillennialists, and 
and they know so I will send to you, I will give you um, the names of these persons so you can check some of, of, of your YouTube presentations, which I indicated you are very good presentations. And in the light of the fact that they were want to be an analyst, but they said that when they began to examine the scripture in pretty detail, and with an open mind, I took off the cloak of, of the criminal view and just look at the scripture and interpret it as it is, they came to a different position. And I guess you might say, well, uh, Reverend Jackman, you basically support the amillennial view, so you might be amillennialist, and you might be defending that. What I indicated you, to you before, that most of my research and most of my reading was connected to premillennialism, and a lot of those views have had, you know, a, a, a very important impression on, on my form of thinking, on my form of examination of, of certain scriptures, and as I indicated, that is what I was inclined to believe. Um, Matthew 24, chapter 24, pointing to the future, because that was registered in my mind. But then they said, as I began to examine the scripture in more depth and more detail, and do references in other places, I recognized that, that that was not what the word was indicated. So I, I came to the position, and I came to the position long before some of those people that I, I would give to you as person that you can check. My position was formed before I, I got any information from, from the theologians because those are only people that I was recently uh, studying. So it's important for us to, to study the scripture with an open mind and examine carefully and draw references to the Old Testament scripture because we must interpret scripture upon scripture. That's another important principle. We will also look at some of the, the, the Greek language used because that offers again some more clarification in Matthew chapter 24 as to when we see the reference made to, to sending out the angels to gather the elect. We will get to understand that the Greek word used for angels, which is, is correct, has also been used in scripture to mean messenger. And therefore we will see a different interpretation that can be applied to that reference sending the angels to gather the elect so that it might not necessarily mean that it's a play into the end of time when the angels are going to gather the elect of God in God's to have an application to a different experience which could be referring to a different time to the scene. All right, so I'm going to pause there. Um, if you have any questions in relation to what I have said, if you have any comments to make, you can do so. Or then I will proceed to go on to look at Matthew chapter 24. We're going to go down from the beginning and go through the references that are important in that passage. Okay, so let's pick up Matthew chapter 24. No questions as yet. No, no comments, I believe. Hope that everything is clear. I'm going to try, as I indicate, to go as slow, try to be as simple as possible because this, this is, a, is a very deep passage. Because they said it has important bearing for how we see eschatology, how we see the future, how we, we interpret events, how we understand scripture. Very important. So we need to get a very clear understanding. So I'm going to read from verse. 1, Matthew chapter 24. As Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him or to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus is departing from the temple. Remember, he started his course in the temple. He's removing himself from the temple. It's going to be the last time that he is going to be in the temple directly. And he is moving out from the temple and he is going towards the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Interesting enough, this is the same vision that Ezekiel saw prior to the destruction of the first temple by King Nebuchadnezzar. Then he overthrew the city, and stole from the treasury, and destroyed the, the, the temple. Ezekiel said he saw in a vision that the Spirit of God 
the glory of God, leaving the temple and resting on the Mount of Olives. Comparatively, Jesus is moving out from the temple. It's the last time that he's moving the temple because his crucifixion is going to follow. And he moves from the temple and he goes to the Mount of Olives. That could be symbolic of the glory of God moving away from the temple, the end of the temple dispensation and what it meant to the, re the religion of that day and Judaism, what it meant in that dispensation. And he's moving on the Mount of Olives where he's going to address the people and he's going to show sign of the end, the end of that era, the end of that dispensation, the end of that form of glory. And we will see that Paul makes reference in the book of Hebrews to the new Jerusalem, the new Zion, being the place where God dwells. And he made reference out of Paul not dwelling in temples made with hands. So it's a change of an era, it's a change of a dispensation, the change of a covenant relationship. And, and this could be symbolic of that. It doesn't indicate it here. So we, we are just drawn on a reference that was made in the Testament by Ezekiel. All right. Now, Jesus is going to the, to the Mount of Olives. He's going to speak to his disciples. And Jesus said unto them, See, ye not all these things? Early I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon the upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So Jesus is going to address two themes in Matthew chapter 24. And these are two themes that, which are related to the questions that have been asked in disciples. Theme one is going to deal with the destruction of the temple. When shall these things be? He told the disciples, at that temple over there in its magnificence and its stately splendor is going to come to an end. It's going to be destroyed. It's not going to be the first time. And watch very carefully how destruction came to the Jews over and over again. Destruction to their place of worship and their temple when they disobeyed God. When they, when they failed to, to, to follow the, the, the covenant instructions so that when we are speaking about promises made to the Jews, we've got to bear in mind that those covenant promises had uh, conditions attached to them. They had conditions attached to them. So we, we need to bear that in mind that, that God's relationship with the Jews, God's dealing with, with, the, with the Jews as a nation, as a people, had certain conditions which, if obeyed and followed, they will get the results and the promises and the blessings that were to come to them. If not, they're going to get judgment and they're going to get destruction. And God is going to use other nations to bring judgment to the same people that are called his people. Jeremiah prophesied that God was going to use the Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment on the children of Israel. And, and then Titus is going to come as a Roman and bring judgment again to the Jewish people and destroy the temple again because they failed to obey the covenant relationship. They did not even accept Jesus as their Messiah who came to them that they crucified. All the prophets that he sent to them, they, they, they failed to obey and pay attention to. And so judgment is going to come as a result. So theme one is dealing with that judgment which will result in the destruction of the temple. And then the second question is used to the second theme, which are to be the signs of your coming and the end of the world. Now, there are among the school of theologians in, in the millennial camp 
who said that Jesus is answering the second question first, indicating then that all of these prophetic signs that are going to follow, which we will examine, that Jesus indicates, which will be signs that will be a prelude to the destruction. These things they are going to see on hold before destruction comes. They say no. Jesus is answering the second question first. What is the rationale for that? Can, can they be justified in making that particular claim? Jesus never said that he is making a reply to the second question first. Never indicated that. He proceeds, he proceeds to answer the questions that have been asked. I didn't believe in the order that they were asked. When shall these things be? And then what shall be the sign of their coming and the end of the world? Now again, we need to draw reference on other scriptures. I indicated to you previously that Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21 are parallel texts which, which harmonize with what we have in Matthew chapter 24. If you look at Matthew chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 21, you will realize that only one question is asked in those passages. One question is asked. And you will notice from the question that has been asked, the same information that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 24, in relation to the signs, is the same information given in, in, in those passages. So you can, you can check those references, Matthew chapter 13. Sorry, Mark, Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, go to that, verse 7. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? They don't ask him, like in Matthew chapter 24, what shall be the sign of your coming? The, 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 the question is just in relation to the destruction of the temple. If you pick up from verse 6, it says, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what, sh what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? So the, the question there is like split in two, but it's, it's, it's making reference to the destruction of the temple. When it is going to happen, and what shall be the sign? Before it happens, what do we have that we can see as signs or indicators that the temple will be destroyed, that these stones will be thrown down? And, and that was the only question that was asked. So, so if the premillennialists want to argue that Jesus was answering the second question first, then they have to come to the fact that in the passage in Mark, in the passage in Luke, that there was only one question asked. And when you look at what follows in, in Luke, when you look for what follows in Mark, it compares significantly with what happens in the account given in Matthew chapter 24. So we're going to look specifically at the prophecies that have been made in Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end, bear in mind, on the line that does not necessarily mean the end of the world, as some people think that it means. 
Jesus is telling them that you are going to get some signs, and one of these signs is that you're going to see wars and rumors of wars. I'm just going to go through here the, the pro prophetic signs, and then I'm going to give you a historical background to show you that all of these signs that Jesus identified were actually fulfilled. So if you're looking for them to happen in the future, saying that, that we might have a dual application or that we might have a secondary prophecy, we have to wait for these signs to unfold. But the reality is the primary interpretation is Jesus saying to the people that is before him, people that are before him, you are going to see these signs unfold before you, before the temple, before the, the temple is destroyed. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are which be in Judea flee unto the mountain. So pay very careful attention to that because we, we, we are saying that Jesus is speaking to a specific group of people in a specific locality and that his prophecy is predicted to a local event rather than a universal event. That's why he says, let them which be in Judea flee onto the mountains. So if we're going to apply this universally to signs that are to come in the future, indicating an, an end of the world event, then why is reference being made to those who are in Judea? Because the, the whole world then will be engaged in, in, in this calamity. The whole world will be engaged in this destruction that is going on. So why would be the specific reference be made and Jesus is telling them when you see these signs, let them which be in Judea flee onto the mountains. We are going to see historically that that actually happened because the people then took Jesus' statement literally and they took it as referring to them. That's why he said when you're interpreting scripture, you must look at the intent of the speaker and you must also look at how the persons he was speaking to interpret it. And, and history uh, relates the fact that, that the, the Jews at that time, the Christians at that time, took what Jesus was saying as an indication to an action they must take. And they did take the action. And again, I'm going to show you that as we go through and greater that historically, when that happened and, and what caused it to happen. Then he says, let him which is on the house talk not come down to take anything out of his house. So if you're taking about a universal calamity that is coming on earth, these are signs that are to come in the future. Again, you have to now understand this in the context of let him which is on the house talk. Jesus is speaking to the specific people in a specific culture, at a specific time. And therefore, this reference will on, help us understand that people used to be on their house talk. And Jesus is saying, if you are there, you you you, you got to watch the signs and, and take action immediately. Neither let him that is in the field return 
back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in, in those days. Watch that carefully. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Those women that are pregnant and lactating. It is going to be such a time of distress that it, it, it is going to be a most difficult experience for people who are pregnant. Because if you are fleeing for your life and you are looking to escape, you're going to want a, 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 a greater time of distress than to have to be looking to flee for your life in that particular time. So I am saying, I am arguing from the context of the passage that Jesus is speaking to the people that are going to be alive in that generation in Judea that will have to escape for their lives from the impending destruction that will be coming on them when Titus comes to invade the city. And pray that your flight is not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And again, flight. If this is a, a prediction for a future event, and it is a universal application for our times and for the world in, in perhaps this century or another century, because according to the, the, the Venice Christ will come anytime, so we, we don't know. But if it's a prediction for the future, a universal prediction that applies sometime down the road, but then what is the context of prayer that your flight? Where, where are you going to be running to go if it's universal? And, and why is the season significant? And why is the Sabbath day significant? The season, because winter, winter for them is a time of a, a lot of rainfall. It's cold. There, there is snow. That is, is going to be a very difficult time for you to escape from Jerusalem. And you see the signs pointing to the impending judgment. And it is winter. And you are pregnant as a female, it's going to be hard. And on the Sabbath, the reference is there being made because the Jews were limited to a particular distance they can travel on the Sabbath day. And obviously, if they're going to be escaping the judgment of the armies of, of Romans coming by the thousands, folks, they are going to have to go far from Jerusalem to escape that judgment. And, and, and take into consideration that the Sabbath will, will, will limit the distance. They can travel on the Sabbath day. So that's why Jesus is making his reference. Pray that is not a winter but on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation. He didn't say the great tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Another literary prophetic sort of, of, of language use. And I'm not going to do it at this point, but when we come back to examining the, the passages in more detail, I will show you how that, that same sort of expression is used. That you have never seen it before, no, you're not going to see it again. Now, reading that, people are inclined to say, aha, pastor, this has got to refer to something in the future. Because what Jesus is saying here is that there shall be great tribulation, which was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So, how do you match the Holocaust that took place when the, the, the Nazis killed over 6 million Jews? If Jesus is saying that, that you're not going to get anything worse than that, we will already have things that were worse than that. So could he be just referring to what happened there in the destruction of Jerusalem? We, we have seen events that were we have had World War II, where millions of people um, were killed. That was a global event. Jesus is speaking to something here that is localized. But I will show you when we get again. So looking at references and comparing them with statements that were made in the Old Testament, you will see the same phrase was used 
in relation to things that happened before. A little example, it, it was that the scripture said it was not the king that had repaired. And there was not one that was going to come after Hezekiah that was like unto him. Same language. And then Josiah came. And it says that there's not one that was before him. And there's not one that is going to come after him that is going to be greater than Josiah. So is the Bible telling lies? No. It is it's a literary expression. And it is used in, in, in references in the Bible, again, not to be taken literally, but just to express express the importance or the significance of the person or the event that it is speaking of. So I will show you in a little more detail some other references that have used that same sort of language. And then, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So, is the shortening meaning the shortening of a day, which means that a day is no less than 24 hours? Is the shortening of the time refer to something that will take place in the future? That for the elect, meaning for the Christians, say it. That's how the premillennialists interpret it. That for the Christians, say it. That the, the tribulation will be shortened. I don't know how short it's going to get when they already predict that it's going to last for seven years. They have given a specific time period that it was going to last for seven years. So where would it be the concept of the shortening of the days take place for the elect sake? I am saying that this reference is being made to the specific people living at that time. And Jesus is going to the distress that is going to take place. It's going to be so traumatic. And, and, and it's an actual historical fact that the days were indeed shortened. Because Titus left Jerusalem, he was the general who overtook it, and was occupying Jerusalem. He invaded the, the, the city and burned the temple to the ground. But then Nero died. Some indication is that he committed suicide. And his generals were jostling for a position to take over as emperor after the death of Nero. And Titus left Jerusalem before the time of his campaign, his military campaign was over because he wanted to go back and be one of the contenders for that position of emperor in Rome after the real death. So, so the days, Jesus probably saying, were actually shortened because had Titus remained in Jerusalem for the full length of the campaign that he was supposed to have, have, have stayed in Jerusalem, it would have been worse. It would have been more tragic. More people would have died. There would have been more distress. So, so that's why Jesus said for, for the elect's sake, for the people who would have been saved in, in that period, for the people who would have moved out and sought refuge, the, the campaign of Titus was actually shortened historically. And that's, that's a fact. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here, or Lo, here is Christ, or, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets. They shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We're going to pause there again for any questions. But then we have to look then and look at the specific prophecies because we have to add in some from Luke because uh, Matthew does not give all the prophetic signs. You have some given in Luke. So we will look at the list that you have there which indicates some other signs that Luke gave. And, and then we will look at the history that has been fulfilled, but that perhaps is indicated will come in that session because we have to look at this in at least two sessions. So any questions you have? Minute, hey, Reverend Jackman. Yes. John here. Um, no question, comment. The okay. story was the lady at the well. 
when when they were discoursing about worship. Worship, yes. We made it clear to her that worship will not go on in Jerusalem. You see, the time is coming and it's now where you should neither yes. worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. That's right. And the time is coming. In other words, Jerusalem will come to end as, as, the, as, the, as the font or the, or the holy place or the Zion that people will slaughter to worship God. Thank you for that reference, Brother John. All right, I'm taking that as an indication that you are very clear. You have nothing to challenge. I'm seeing a comment in the chat where there was one some clarities. If you're suggesting that all of the details in Matthew 24 are historical and not prophetic. They, they are prophetic. And they are historical. They are prophetic because when Jesus was speaking, they did not happen as yet. So they are prophetic. He is saying that these are things that will come. Remember, Jesus is, 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 is making these predictions before his crucifixion. He is making, he made his exit from the temple and he is speaking to the people and telling them this temple is going to come to an end. This era is going to come to an end. This, this old covenant experience is going to come to an end and it's going to be a beginning of a new world. And, and as I said, when it, when it comes to specific uh, scripture references, you will see that that is what Jesus intended to show. So he's showing them signs that are a prelude to the destruction of the temple. So it's prophetic. And it's historical in that the signs that Jesus gave were actually fulfilled in AD 70. As I said, I will show you those things and perhaps we'll, we will pick those things up in the next session. We look at the signs and then I'll show you the parallel fulfillment of the prophecy. So yes, they are prophetic and they are historical. And therefore prophetic for them, not prophetic for us. Right. But 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 there's some theologians, and, and I, I am not hard on theologians who have that particular view that maybe they could have a double act. But remember, we said that it is important when you are when you are doing the hermeneutics of a particular text that, that you first take the interpretation as meant in the context, and then you can have the application. So there's a context in the prophecy, and there's an actual fulfillment of that prophecy in a time that has already passed. That's the context, and it's, it's historical. Now, if you want to say perhaps there could be a parallel coming to that in the future, that we could have earthquakes and famines and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars and all of that, because that's what people are doing. They're looking for the frequency of earthquakes. I was doing that too. I was accounting the wars and looking at the wars that are coming, the diseases that are coming upon mankind in the pestilences, and believing that that is what Matthew was suggesting. What I'm saying is, Jesus made a specific prophecy to a specific people for a specific time, and that time was fulfilled. If we want to make an application, that's fine. But what I'm saying, we don't have any evidence for it because we will have to wait for that prophecy to be fulfilled in the future. So we will only know if our interpretation is accurate if we actually see the signs. What I'm saying is we have signs that have already been fulfilled accurately. I will show you. In the next session, the historical data, which is there for our reference, which was written by an eyewitness who was there, who went to the experience. And we have the historical records that we can check to show that what Jesus actually said came to pass. We will also look at the book of Acts and see that some of the things happened to the disciples in the books of the book of Acts, which recorded the history of, of those disciples that, that live in that same period that Jesus was probably saying. As a matter of fact, some of them were even killed before the temple was actually destroyed. We 
Apostle John was still around because he, he wrote the revelation, they say, in the period prior to the destruction of the temple, which means, in fact, that some of what John was saying could have been a reference to that same destruction that Jesus spoke about. Uh, so, Eddie? Yes. Um, someone is asking you to go over the your comments on the days being shortened for the elect say. All right. No, I asked the question, first of all, if we thought it could mean, when we say the days being shortened, we mean a, 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 a literal day, in terms of a 24-hour day, that it would be shortened. I don't, I don't think that that would be the application that we could play, because even though saying they say that the days are shortening by fractions of a, of a second, I don't, I don't think we can really account that as, as anything significant in terms of the shortening of a day. So I don't believe it in this, the shortening of a day. And, and then if they're going to take it as a shortening of, of the time of the tribulation or the elect state, meaning the tribulation in the future, then how would that apply to their interpretation when they already said that the tribulation is going to last for seven years? They have given a specific time reference that they believe is going to happen. So then what would the shortening mean? Is it going to cut from seven years to six or five to four? When they have already interpreted the scripture of that, of that um, one week in Daniel to mean that there's a prophetic week that has to be fulfilled of seven years of tribulation. If it's but it means it has to happen. So it can't be shortened if it's prophetically um, made that it was going to take place for seven years. If you understand what I'm making. So historically, I'm saying the application is there because when you look back at the history, I am saying that the time that Titus occupied Jerusalem was actually shortened beyond what was intended to be. And it, 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 it relieves some of the distress and the hardship for some of the people living at the time that would have been considered as the elect or that people that would come to Christ that could be saved. And some of those who had escaped from Jerusalem because Christians did escape. And there is an actual record indicating that all the Jewish Christians took Jesus' word seriously and they flee. They went across the Jordan and settled in a place called Pela. That's a historical fact. And Jesus had told them, when you see these things begin to unfold, get out of that place. And incidentally, just to give you a little historical fact, how did they get the time to do that? The Roman armies occupied the city. But the Jews, you see the wars and rumors of wars, we get to see that there was a lot of fighting going on there. And there, there really were wars and rumors of wars that were going on in that period of about four or five years before the destruction of the temple came. And one of the generals got, ran out of the city um, by, the, by the zealots that were there. And he surrounded the city, but then they said, with no explanation at all, he just left the city. I think this was General Vespasian was his name. And he left. He removed his armies. And that was when Titus sent back, um, sorry, Nero sent back in Titus. And during the period of time that he left and, and Titus returning, the, the Jewish Christians took that time to escape the city, every one of them, as Jesus had commanded. That was their great period. They took advantage of and they escaped. So they got out of the city before Titus got back with, with even larger armies. And, and a bigger military and surrounded the city for five days. Folks, that was what caused the famine and the pestilence in the city. Five days without food. Nobody could get out, nobody could come in. And, and, and the record is, as, as Luke indicated, brother rose up against brother, father against son. The people actually literally, literally deceived one another, killed one another for food. Because the family was so severe, we will get more details on that and look at the history. So the shortening of the days then uh, referred to the literally 
it was short of the days in that, that period of time that was indicated historically. If there's one more, you can take it. It's just two minutes after nine. If there's another question, you can take it before we close. So, Reverend Jotman, there's another one here um, from the chat. The court wars and rumors of wars. Yes. Is this wars as we know it, or is it about a so-called Jewish war in 1866 to 73? There, there were more wars than that one in 1863. There were, there were wars among the Jews themselves, because again, I will indicate that historically, the Jews were in faction. Some of them supported the Romans, because remember the Romans were there from 86 to three, when the Emperor Pompey um, took the city. So the Romans had established their presence and they took control of the city. Some of the Jews supported the Romans and some of the Jews were anti-Roman. They fought among themselves. So wars took place among the Jews themselves. There were wars among them. Then there were Jews fighting against other nations outside of Jerusalem. And then there were Jews actually fighting among the Romans. And I mentioned two of, of persons there that they were fighting against. So, so there were a lot of wars. Jews fought against Alexandrians, they fought against the Samaritans, they fought um, against the people of Caesarea. They, they, they fought a whole number of wars during that period. There was a lot of fighting going on. So that's where really the concept of wars and rumors of wars as a sign of the end of the city drawing near, the destruction that was coming. So people tend to think that that refers to our time, that there'll be wars and rumors of wars, and, and the more wars we see, the more we believe that applies. And you can have that sort of dual application, but what I'm saying is that there was a historical fulfillment in relation to that particular sign already. Reverend Eddie, I think in this regard, um, the book by Josephus, Wars of the Jews, would be good reading material. Excellent. Excellent reading material. Because a lot of the records are taken from the wars of Josephus. Remember, Josephus is, is a prominent and, and very respected historian. And he is an eyewitness in that he was just taking information from some audio recording. He was actually there. He was actually involved. In, in some of those conflicts, and he saw the destruction. And so he could you know, account for a lot of things that went on. And some of them are actually gruesome. He said that during the famine, people even ate some of their own family members. It was, it was real distress, seriously. But we are going to get more details in next week's session. So next week's session should be very interesting because we're going to look at the specific prophecies and look at the specific fulfillments. So we're going to get some historical references, and we're going to draw, as Brother John said, on the words of Josephus and the account that he gives within those details. And we're going to look at some comparisons with Old Testament prophecies to show what Jesus meant with some of the statements that he made that were pretty difficult to understand because of the language that was used and are sometimes misinterpreted because of that language. We're going to see how it compares language that was previously used and what it meant when it was used then. So that's the next session I would want you to miss. So thank you for being there. You had um, some little notes there as indicators. I will try to keep, um, give you some notes that you can follow the other sessions that are coming. And as I said, I promise you that I will give you some notes um, from some of the, the sessions that have gone before. So thank you for, for, for listening. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to more questions. I want you to challenge me. I, I, I'm looking forward for your challenge because I, I want you to feel free to express yourself, to disagree with me, and to challenge me to defend the position based on the same scriptures I'm using. So good night to you, and, and God bless you. I'm looking forward to seeing you next Tuesday. All, good All right.